Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I am Drew Garris, your moderator for today's session. I'm a board member and programming chair for the South Jersey chapter of the CFMA. I'm also a surety bond producer with the Garris Agency in Springhouse, Pennsylvania. On behalf of the South Jersey chapter, thank you for being here uh, for today's webinar on PPP loan forgiveness. This is a hot topic and still evolving given even just this past Friday's Paycheck Protection Program Flexibility Act. I have to make sure I speak slow when I'm saying that whole that whole thing. I know, I know it's a bit of a mouthful. Uh, before I introduce our presenters, I'm going to plug the CFMA a bit here, uh, the Construction Financial Management Association. Uh, the organization is a resource most known for your financial team, CFOs and controllers. You will also find resources and education for your operations team. Uh, the old adage uh, comes to mind, it takes a village, successful teams, successful projects, and successful companies. You can find more information about CFMA and local chapters near you at CFMA, uh, www.cfma.org. Uh, our chapter and others are all in a similar, similar position right now. Uh, many of us are used to in-person seminars for education, CPE, and networking. Um, with COVID-19 and all the shutdown, we're all embarking into new territory here uh, with webinars trying to get you content that you're used to from the CFMA. This is only our second webinar and our first on GoToMeeting. Uh, we've had some help setting this up, and I would like to acknowledge uh, Olivia Paris Cornilowitz for her work in making today happen. She was truly was instrumental in the setup and helping train us on this platform. So thank you, Olivia. Our presenters today, we have some real professionals and experienced uh, people with us. Marion Cornilowitz, Chair of the Business Transaction Group for Cohen Seglius. Kimberly Holfish, controller slash financial manager of C. Abenizio Contractors. And last but not least, Tony Stagliano, national director of construction industry services with CBiz AM at MHM. Uh, I am aware personally that both Kim and Tony have significant history with the CFMA, our local chapters, as well as regional and national conferences. If you're interested, they will gladly speak to you about the value of the organization. Uh, for the presentation, we have roughly 15 minutes for each presenter with a Q&A session afterwards. Um, we may go a little bit past noon uh, to answer your questions if necessary. If you have questions during the presentation, there is a GoToMeeting control panel on your screens, and there's a box for questions. You can enter your questions there during the presentation. Uh, after the webinar, you will be given access to a recording of today's presentation along with a copy of the PowerPoint. Again, thank you all for being here with us today. With that, we will begin the presentation with Mary. Good afternoon, folks, or actually good morning. I want to thank the CFMA for this opportunity to present to you all. I'm going to start off with um, an overview of the CARES Act. It's hard to believe it's only been two and a half months since the act was passed. Um, the act is titled Paycheck Protection Program, and it talks about keeping American workers paid and employed. And that's a context we should keep in mind throughout the entire process. Um, it was passed on March 27th. Within a month, it ran out of money. The initial amount of $349 billion was augmented with in amount of 321 billion. As of this morning, about 511 billion has been approved. So there still is substantial sum of money sitting in um, the fund. Beginning on April 2nd, the SBA published 16 interim final rules, which were intended to inform, provide guidance, and clarify the loan process. The most recent one was issued last Friday. Beginning on April 3rd, the SBA published a total of 48 frequently asked questions, and the most recent one was issued on May 27th. On June 5th, the Paycheck Protection Program was signed into law, and I'll discuss that in some detail in a moment. Uh, as a result of that act and the ongoing issues that keep on cropping up, expect more IFRs and FAQs as this process goes on. So last Friday, 
the PPP Flexibility Act was signed into law. The big thing is it extends till December 31st, 2020, the time within which to apply for a loan. It increases the covered period of the loan from eight to 24 weeks. Existing borrowers have the option to stay with eight weeks or opt into the 24 week period. In this context, I wanna sort of raise the issue that closure is a good thing to have on this process because it's been a hectic two and a half months. It's gonna continue if you choose to go to December 31st. An interesting question is, is the option eight weeks or 24 weeks, or can a borrower opt in for a shorter period of time? Unanswered, nothing out there yet about that. It creates a safe harbor or extends the safe harbor for rehiring employees from June 30th till December 31st, 2020. And that's great for maybe a lot of people, but keep in mind that additional time might be additional risk depending on what happens to the economy. You may not want to be bringing back everyone on December 31st to be able to qualify for forgiveness. With respect to loan forgiveness, um, the Flexibility Act um, codified a couple of issues or exemptions that um, the SBA has been working through the FAQs and, and the interim final rules. So if you weren't able to hire individuals that were hired as of, December, as of February 15th, or you were unable to hire similarly qualified employees, or you weren't able to return to the same level of business activity you had on February 15th, you still will be able to qualify for forgiveness. You won't be prejudiced by those three exemptions. The act increased the amount the borrowers can spend on non-payroll items, including rent and utilities from 25 to 40%. The CARES Act didn't provide any numbers. The 25-75 the split was generated by the SBA, um, and the legislature said that that was too strict a, a, a breakup of the um, non-payroll and payroll costs. However, the statute states pretty strongly that if you want to if you want to qualify for forgiveness, you have to have at least 60% of the loan covering payroll costs. Given the extension to December 31st, so 24 weeks, that really shouldn't be a problem for most. It extends the six-month deferral period for payments to at least 10 months. So 10 months after your period ended, um, there's no payments to be made. Um, the CARES Act originally provided a maximum term of 10 years. The SBA said we want two years. The legislature says that um, we want a minimum of five years. And for existing loans, the, the act says that the borrower and the lender is free to renegotiate the term, presuming most lenders will agree to go to the five-year term. There's a deferral of certain payroll taxes, which were covered also by the Flexibility Act. So loan applications, I wanna discuss this a little bit. Um, this is not the focus of this presentation, but keep in mind that loan applications will now be acceptable until December 31st, 2020. An issue which has been driving borrowers crazy and commentators is the, to the extent to which forgiveness and the loan itself can be challenged by the SBA on the basis of certifications made by the borrower as part of the application. The biggest certification is the one that's on the bottom of this slide, which says that an eligible recipient applying for a covered loan shall make a good faith certification that the uncertainty of the economic condition makes necessary the loan request to support the ongoing operations of the eligible recipient. So, couple points I want to make is that the certification is what happens at the time of the application, not what is existing today or in three or four months when you're asking for forgiveness. It's a good faith standard. You don't have to be right. You just have to have reached a conclusion in good faith. Um, uncertainty, I think in this industry there was a lot of uncertainty. Last point I want to sort of focus on is that it's not an the, the SBA has talked about the necessity of a loan. That's not what the legislature says. And I don't know whether this is just parsing too many in issues, but it talks about 
making the loan request necessary as opposed to the loan itself. Another section of the CARES Act I'm going to bring to your attention is the credit elsewhere section. Under the SBA typical loan structure, if you're eligible for a loan through a traditional bank, you can't qualify for an SBA loan. So the legislature, when it passed the CARES Act, said that this requirement of not being eligible elsewhere is being waived for this particular legislation. So it would be very difficult, I think, for the SBA to say that, well, you could have qualified for a loan elsewhere when the legislature was so emphatic about how credit elsewhere is not a condition for this loan. Um, frequently asked question number 31 was the one that caused all the consternation. It talked about economic need for a PPP loan, but keep in mind it discussed large companies, public companies with substantial market value, access to capital, not financial markets, sources of liquidity sufficient to support their ongoing operations in a matter that is not significantly detrimental to the business. And, and that's important. Um, it included a safe harbor that if you repay it in a certain period of time because of a misunderstanding, there'll be no repercussions. FAQ number 39 sort of um, stated that we're going to review, the SBA is going to review all loans in excess of $2 million, stating that maybe anything under $2 million is a safe harbor. Uh, a couple of weeks later, it emphatically said that there is a safe harbor for loans than two million, less than $2 million. But it also states that if the SBA determines that a borrower lacks the adequate basis for its certification, it will seek repayment. And if the borrower repays after receiving the notice from the SBA, the SBA will not pursue any administrative enforcement or make referrals to other agencies. So that's important for the context. This is not a silver bullet or a get out of jail card for fraud, um, but it does make, should make most borrowers much more comfortable with respect to the certification they made at the time of the loan. The loan forgiveness. Um, loan forgiveness provides that um, the, the SBA will forgive the loan, the lenders will forgive the loan um, for amounts paid during this 8 or 24 week period, maybe 16 week period, for payroll costs, any payment on interest on covered mortgage obligations, any payment on any covered rent obligations, and any covered utility payment. This language is from the statute. There's a lot of ambiguity. Does Covered rent payment include both real estate and personal property. It appears that it does. Utility payments, what does it include? It includes internet, does it include transportation? Those are the issues that to some extent have been answered by the SBA and others have not. The cover costs apply to existing obligations as of February 15th. And the good news is that these forgiven amounts are not included in a borrower's taxable income. All right, subject to certain exemptions which we discussed above under the Flexibility Act and the safe harbor, which we'll talk about in a moment, the forgiveness amount will be reduced if the borrower reduces the number of full-time employees during the loan forgiveness period or reduce an employee's total salary wage in excess of 25%. And there are formulas which People will talk about later on. I just laid them out here. Um, also, there's language about $100,000, and, and that will be covered later on by others. There is a safe harbor which provides that any reduction in, in salary, age, in wages, and the number of employees um, will not impact on forgiveness if everyone is back by December 31st, 2020. I provide a link for the application. It will be revised in light of the Flexibility Act. There have been a couple of IFRs that have dealt in detail with forgiveness. Those will be modified. The first one was number 14. That's my numbering. It was posted on May 22nd. It's lengthy. Um, it does talk about SPE being 40 hours per week, which is contrary to what the SBA has done in past and other loans. I think it's contrary to what the IRS holds, but that's what they put in that particular rule. 
Rule 15 um, discusses the review process that the SBA will, re will use, and it says that it has the right and it will review the certifications, the borrower's representation, and the use of proceeds at any time in the SBA's discretion. Time period, just some quick time periods. Um, the Flexibility Act requires that if there is no loan forgiveness application, you need to commence payment of principal interest and fees within 10 months after the end of your covered period. You file the application, it's a, it's a formula, it's after the decision is made and a certain period of time after that. The CARES Act requires the lender to make a decision on loan forgiveness within 60 days, and then the SBA is required to remit to the lender the amount of the forgiven loan within 90 days. That's a quick overview and outline. Um, any questions, please submit them, and we'll try our best to answer them. Excellent. Uh, I'm going to insert myself here a minute. Kim, I have a question for you. Um, I've seen some emails supposedly from the SBA about creating a loan portal account or failure to do so may result in withdrawal of your application. Have you heard of anything like that? Can you hear me now? Can hear you now. Okay, I apologize. I thought I took myself off of mute. Um, so there were a lot of scams in the very beginning with um, emails and click here to check on your loan application and things like that, or call this number um, so they can deposit it in your bank. You never want to click on links. Um, you always want to check phone numbers before you call. and. The scams are going to start back up again as soon as people start putting in these loan forgiveness applications. So again, pick up the phone and call who you're dealing with and don't click on links um, and you should be fine. Thank you. Anything else, Drew, before I start? No, have at it. Okay, so I am going to briefly go over the loan forgiveness application um, and there's a couple things you need to know at first. Um, the loan forgiveness application that I'm reviewing is dated 520. It will be revised for the June 5th Flexibility Act. Uh, one of the main changes you will see on that application will be the 60% cliff. Um, most people are interpreting the cliff as there'll be no reduction in loan forgiveness. If you don't meet the 60% wages, then there'll be no loan forgiveness. Um, but that's still a little bit up in the air. Um, another thing that's up in the air is the cap is based on $100,000 annually, and it's unclear if the 24-week cap will remain the same as the eight-week cap of 15384 or if the cap will be uh, based on the 24-week period, which would be $46,153. Um, today's webinar will focus on the eight-week period capped at 15000 for anyone making 100000 annually including the owners, which we'll talk about separately. Um, and we are also going to focus on the PPP Schedule A worksheet of the application. So on the application, you want to start from the back and work your way forward. And your starting point is Schedule A on the worksheet, Table 2. And Table 2 is anybody who annualized makes more than $100,000, or if they make less than $100,000, but for one pay period in 2019, they made more than $1,923.08, which annualizes to $100,000. So if you have a week where employees got a bonus or they had a lot of overtime, you want to check those weeks because the key in Table 2, anyone listed in Table 2, you do not have to test for uh, reduction. Any questions so far on that, Drew? I'm going pretty fast. No, no, you're good. You're good. Thanks. Okay. Uh, you also want to have two table twos, which they don't tell you at the back of the application. You run into it as you carry the numbers up. You want to have the owners listed separately. They have the same cap as everyone else, 100000 annualized, 
15384 for the eight-week period, but they want them listed on a separate spot in the application, so do not include them in Table 2. Have two tables, uh, all employees and then owners. Then, after you do Table 2, you want to calculate the average FTE for each person. So you really want a column for hours. You want your payroll program to be able to pull the hours out during this time period. And you take the, well, we'll go through an example, but you take the average FTE for each person. It cannot exceed one. So if they had overtime, it can only be one. And for each person, you'll have to test them for the FTE uh, forgiveness portion. Table one is then all employees who didn't meet the criteria in table two. So they made less than 100,000 annualized in the current year. And in 2019, there is no week where they made more than $1,923. And you fill in the same type of information as you did on table two, except there's a new column for wage reduction. And again, the average FTE cannot be greater than one. So we have a couple examples here. We have three employees, two are hourly, one is salary, and you have to determine if they have a wage reduction. Now again, this might change with a new application, um, but you should know how to calculate it, and you would just change it from 75 to 60%. So you have Diana who made uh, 11,997 in the eight week period, and based on her hours, her FTE was 0 0.97. And then you have two other people. One is salaried, Alexandra is salaried, and she's only 0.375. So somewhere her hours got cut. So for the first employee, for Diana, you have to take what she made in the eight-week period, but then the white portion of the screen, you have to compare it to the first quarter. So in the first quarter of 2020, she made 12,378, and she had 333.5 hours. That gave her an average wage of 37.32. Then you take your eight-week period, and you figure out that her average wage was 38.7. So because her wage was higher in the eight-week period than it was in quarter one, there is no loan uh, reduction on this. This is a similar example for an hourly employee. And um, in this case, um, while the employee made less than the eight weeks, it was 96%. So it's higher than 75% and there's no loan reduction. And then Alexandra, who's the salaried employee, in the first quarter, she made 29,000, I'm sorry, 23,920 and she worked 320 hours. But in the eight week period, she made 8,970. So the first thing you do is enter the average annual salary for the covered period. So that would be 8,970 divided by eight weeks times 52 weeks, gives you 58,000. Then you take the first quarter, you do the same thing, you annualize it, and she made 95,000. So she only made 60% of her salary in the eight-week period, which is below the 75%. So then you had to go to step two and enter the average annual salary that she made for the week including February 15th, which was 95,000. So you would take that week times 52. And then you enter the average annual salary between February 15th and April 26th. And in this case, that was 66,000. So because 66,000 is less than the 90, you have to go on to the next step. So in step 2C slash 3, it gets a little complicated. So you multiply the amount in line 1B, which if you go back to the other screen, 1B is 95,680. So you take 95,680 times 75%, which is 71,000. You subtract 71,000 from 1A. And again, 1A was the 58,000 number. And so you have a 13,000 difference. 
So the employee is an hourly worker. Okay, she's not, so you don't want to do that. You want to go down all the way to, um, I'm sorry, I got lost on this one. Um, you have 13,000, they're not hourly. Under the average number of hours between January 1st and March, multiply that amount by 3C. And you come up down here with the 10,000, or I'm sorry, negative 107,640. Divide that by 52 and you get 2,070. There's an alternate way to do it over here. You take the same two numbers at the top and divide each by 52 weeks. This, to me, this is easier. You subtract the two, you get two you get $258.75 times eight weeks. You get the same negative 2,070 for the loan reduction. From there, you want to calculate what your FTE average is. And you can use two different groups. You can use 1-6-2020 to 3-1-2020. And you go through those nine weeks. You enter your total payroll hours, not to exceed 40, so leave out any overtime. And you get your average FTE per time period. And the average for the nine weeks is 62.54. Now, there's another time period you can use, and I really didn't think it would work, but for us it did. You can use 217.19 to 630.19, which is a 20-week time period. You enter all your hours, not to exceed 40 for each week. You get your average FTE. Sorry, I didn't mean to go backwards. And you come up with the 58.53, which is less than the 62, so you want to use the lower of the two numbers for your FTE. And it will work better for you in the long run. So that's 58 that you're going to use. Now, if you are a seasonal employer, you can pick any 12-week period between May 1, 2019 and September 15, 2019 to calculate your FTEs. You just have to be consistent throughout the application. And there is a safe harbor that you can run through on the application. Um, this will probably change a little bit, but it's based on June 30th. And in essence, uh, through all their calculations, if your FTEs on June 30th are higher than your FTE in the week that includes February 15th, you most likely can claim safe harbor on the FTEs and you will not have a reduction in loan for having a few, um, less employees during the eight-week period. From there, you just carry all the numbers up to Schedule A, and the application becomes simple because you're just pulling numbers from all the tables that you just did and plugging them in. And this is where they want the compensation to owners separate from everybody else. Um, and that's why Table 2, you want to do two tables. You total the payroll costs from Table 1 and Table 2 without the employer, without the owners. And then you do your full-time equivalency reduction calculations that we just went through. And then all the above sections will subtotal and they're brought to page one. So from this point on, you're plugging numbers that you already have. And the first page, this is what it runs through. Um, your payroll costs, your business mortgage interest, your business rent or lease payments, and business utility payments. Now, I know a lot of people have questions on the transportation part of utilities. The only thing I can find on that so far, and it's not an official government site, it's an accountant site. Um, one accountant states that the transportation cost is for self-employed people, and they can use either gas in their vehicle or the miles set by the IRS. Uh, to calculate that. I haven't seen anything else, and again, the self-employment part is not from an official government site. Um, and then you run through the adjustments for full-time um, equivalents and sal salary hourly wage deductions. And at this point, 
it's probably going to change a little bit due, due to the Flexibility Act. And then it's just ma simple math to run through your forgiveness amount. Now, I know I ran through that really fast, and you probably have questions. So I don't know if Drew wants to ask a couple now and then move on to Tony, or if you want all questions at the end. Uh, this is true. We are getting quite a few questions here. This is uh, this is good. I think maybe we will give Tony an opportunity to go through his presentation uh, first and try to get some to, to some questions at the end. Um, and uh, Olivia might be able to uh, check with me on the side. I, we might be able to have some audio from if there are some audio audio questions as well. Um, Tony, before you do start your presentation, are there a couple of initial things a contractor can do to prepare? for uh, their forgiveness audit. Oh, thanks, Drew, uh, and uh, welcome, everyone. Yeah, I think there's a couple of things just to, just to highlight, and I'll get into some of the details. But I think the first thing is just to realize that you, you need to document a lot of the information. Uh, just like Kim went through, the devil's in the details. There's a lot of information that they want to have. So document, paper your files. I'll get into that a little bit deeper. And also, probably the, another main thing would be to reach out to your banker because they're going to be doing the quote audit. And I put that in quotation marks, and I'll mention that in a second. Uh, and so, as in the application, most banks and lending institutions wanted to have their own form. All right. So the question will be: Will they will they be using the same uh, new IRS, well, not IRS form, but the new SBA form uh, 3508? Uh, because if you're doing all the steps that Kim went through, and I think you'd still have to do that no matter what, you want to make sure that that's what they're going to ask for when it comes time to turn in the, the uh, application for the for the refund. So uh, there, there are a couple of my key things, just pay attention to those two. Uh, I think Marion and Kim did a, a great job in, in setting a table for me and the audit process. As, as again, Kim pointed out, uh, there's a lot of steps and I would, would going through the program myself and the application for the refund, and I really boiled down to I just have to do it one step at a time. And like she said, work from the back towards the front where the main schedule is. And uh, it, it just follows. It's methodical and, and time consuming. But uh, document all that. And also, as Marion said, this is still very fluid. Things are changing. Uh, I mentioned a couple of things I think will change as we go through. Uh, but you just have to understand that this new uh, act, uh, Flexibility Act, it only came out, you know, on the 3rd of, uh, was approved on the 3rd, 4th, yeah, 5th of June, I'm sorry, and, uh, and signed by the president. So it's only the 9th. So it's been a lot of, a lot of, seems like it's been a week or two, but uh, that's the way this uh, whole process has been working. Uh if you go to my, uh, if I go to my first slide here, it's my, uh, okay, there we go. Uh, I put down here audit considerations. Uh, I'm not going to go through the top part of that, uh, but the borrower certification, Marion mentioned that you, you certified going in when you applied for the application, that everything is accurate and true to your best of knowledge and, and best of your ability to know. Uh, so that you are certifying. You're also going to certify going out on the end for, for the actual forgiveness form. So it's important to just remember that it's being certified, which kind of takes me into the uh, the next thing, which unfortunately uh, my buttons aren't working on the advancing here. Thank you. Um, one of the main things was, did you have a, a real need for this loan? And they made a big deal out of this because some companies, as Marion mentioned, uh, applied for a loan and they were public companies. And uh, the U and Cry uh, was warranted, but uh, they withdrew uh, their application and refunded the money. But uh, I don't think that this is going to be such a big deal if you just write a memo, and that's my suggestion, document, write a memo, list, you know, take these bullet points and just blend them into a paragraph. And basically, that plus at the last bullet I have down there is tell your story, uh, the fact that you've made a good faith effort. One of my one of my clients actually sent 
and they're going to put this in their file, a uh, memo or you know, by email out to all of their customers and saying basically that they are shutting down uh, because the state has mandated that all construction cease uh, because of COVID-19. And they're going to put that in their file. And that, they shut down on the 16th of March and weren't able to start up until June the 1st. Uh, for all practical purposes. That's a long time to be out of work. So again, just document that, put it in your file, and you can move on. Again, the next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, this was what you did in the very beginning. I would plan to put the exact same documentation that you used for the application, just put it in your file, your folder, all right? Check with your bank. Do they want it electronic? Do they want it in paper, all right? count on probably having to do both. But uh, document all of your uh, reasons for the for getting the loan, the math you used, the schedules you came up with, you export it probably from Excel into, uh, I mean, into Excel from your uh, payroll system, and then manipulate it from there to get the benefits uh, tacked onto that and limiting to the $100,000. So that, that should be a given, just put that in the file. Uh, next slide, please. Okay. There's been a lot of talk, and you heard Marion explain, and even Kim had mentioned it, that it, we're now into, oh, is it 56 weeks? I mean, 56 days or eight weeks, and or is it 26? If your loan was a, a given before the uh, the enactment of the uh, the new uh, act itself, uh, just a couple a week ago, then you can ha opt into one or the other. So. What I would say is, look at your records. You should be keeping score now, uh, how you're doing with your payroll and benefits each week as achieving your goal within that eight week period. And if it turns out that it doesn't look like you're going to, to make it, uh, in other words, use up all the money, uh, you may want to opt to the do 24 weeks and extend it to the, so you get the, to that point. Going to the 24 weeks, it's very unlikely that contractors, assuming they're back to work, uh, will have a problem of meeting uh, the eligibility requirements just on the payroll itself and benefits. But uh, you have to look at your individual circumstances and determine whether that applies to you and will work. So uh, again, it's kind of back-ended. It's either eight or 24. Uh, 24 might take you out to uh, you know a, a period of time that uh, you know you weren't actually expecting to, to be waiting for you know, or to close this. Most of my clients, a lot of them got their, their money on the 4th of uh, May. So the 27th of, of June, which is only a couple of weeks from now, will end their eight week period. And so got to monitor that. And let's say, say you got a loan today or yesterday, uh, which would be the 8th of June, it would take you out to the 20th of November if you took the 24 months and you did the 24 months. And you can't go beyond 1231 of 20. So uh, again, note down there at the bottom, that Kim alluded to this, we're not sure, but it looks like it would be the limit on eight weeks is 15384 and possibly the limit on 24 and you can see the math is 46,154. Um, however, the salary limit is still and based on that uh, and less than 24 months. So go to the next slide, please. A lot of this stuff has already been covered as far as the, the eligibility details. And now we're getting into the uh, applicable costs and non-payroll related costs. And the uh, question becomes, uh, Besides the payroll, what about the interest payments on mortgages? That's all the, the uh, act calls for. It doesn't say anything other than the fact that I've seen it many places, uh, either in other seminars, other you know, editorials, if you would, that interest on any business debt would be covered. Again, going back to your bank or your lending institution, what is their definition of interest does it include that? A couple of the banks I've talked to said yes, but find out from them. 
And remember, the SBA is going to be looking over everybody's shoulders, so you may want to document that, that the bank said that that's, that's allowable. Uh, then rent and or lease payments. Again, the application pretty much says rent on real property and personal property. Uh, what about the leasing of your equipment? If you're uh, you buy your rent forms or something, if you're a concrete contractor, uh, I think the, your bank will probably say yes, they're includable. But just get that straightened out with them, and make sure that you're on the same wavelength. Now, transportation is under the in the utility section. That's still up in the air, as you've heard. Uh, I have heard the only thing I've heard is gas. I don't know what that means. I've heard other people talk about repairs and maintenance of equipment, vehicles, et cetera. Again, I would ask my banker, what are you going to accept for transportation? And you tell them that, and they may say, yeah, sounds right to me. Okay, my banker said this. All right. So all of these things uh, roll up into getting your uh, non-payroll uh, uh, numbers. But as you've heard, the uh, amount has gone from 25, 75, 75 being the payroll unrelated, uh, to 60, 40. And it, it, there is a cliff there. I think that you're going to find that, uh, I know so, Senators uh, uh, Rubio and, and Collins indicated that a few technical tweaks could be made, like a sliding scale in that area. Uh, but that remains to be seen. It only makes sense. But We'll see what happens. Next slide, please. All right. There we go. Thank you. Uh, items that can reduce your forgiveness amount. Now, this is where it gets a little, uh, I guess I'll call it dicey. Uh, there's probably two things. One, A, you don't hit your, your payroll number at all. Uh, so you you would only get up to at least that plus your benefits. So you probably will come up short and you'd have to either take a loan or give back some of the money. Again, I would look at that carefully and say, do I want to extend my period so that they can use all the money? Keeping in mind, it's an absolute gift to the from the IRS. All right, in this case, from from the SBA the government, uh, you get to deduct. Uh, you charge, you know, pay for your payroll that you normally would do and bill your customer. As you normally get, and that gets you know paid to you, and that covers your payroll and other expenses. And the government gives you payroll to pay your payroll, uh, so you get it twice. So don't you know lose the opportunity to get as much of, of your debt forgiven as possible. And so Kim went through these dates. You have to do the dates as far as whether you know the FTE point, uh, and now it is 40, and that was clarified on uh, May the 15th. Uh, with the guidance that came out then, and keep track of your schedule and, and see how that is, is working out. And there's a couple of options there. Don't need to get into the, 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 the weeds on that. So next slide, please. Okay. This is safe harbors in, in, in the wage reductions because they want you to look back to, uh, you know, say the 15th of February. And what were your your wages in the prior year? And what are they now for the same employee? And or do you have a 25% reduction in in the uh, amount of uh, wages from that prior period? They have pretty much gone away. Uh, most of this stuff, like the extension from you know 25% uh, of the non payroll related to the you know 40%, it's giving you much more latitude. The ability to take uh, and get the full reduction. Uh, the fact that on the uh, FTEs, they said that basically uh, you, you don't have to really be concerned with that. And I'll, and I'll just go to the next slide so we can leave time for questions here. Uh, next slide, please. There we go. So the exemptions for reduction, the borrower is unable to rehire former employees. You know, some won't come back, number one, because if they, they're making more money in unemployment than they are with that $600, then they would be coming back to work. That's another story, and you have to make letters and all that jazz. Um, business is unable to restore the business operations to the February 15th level. 
all right, because of the coronavirus. That's that's an out. So just document the fact again, document the fact that you couldn't if you have any of these people. Uh, and that pretty much, you know, makes it easy. Going back to the threshold of two million versus uh, under two million in, in, in the borrowings, they did say that anything under two million dollars is just a foregone conclusion that you needed the money. I don't know what the difference between that and two million is, but that's where they did the cutoff. But they've even eased, eased that. So there's a lot of, like, you know, they're, they're trying their, their darndest to get the money out there into the into the economy and have all of this stuff qualify. So let me get into the financial and the tax considerations briefly. The forgiveness uh, for uh, the, uh, for I'll call it gap purpose of your financial statements, it's most likely going to be treated as a forgiveness of debt and other income on your uh, income statement where you have your interest expense and, and interest income and gain on sale of equipment and so forth. Uh, and that's fine. Uh, we'll talk about the timing of that in a second. And the other is on the uh, on the tax side, uh, they will not tax the forgiveness. All right. However, they want it to, uh, it, uh, to be re reducing your costs, whatever cost you paid and use the money for. They want you to reduce the cost. Uh, I think it would have been simpler to, to, and they may change this, simpler to just say. Let's do follow the uh, the, the uh, gap guidance or the financial statement position and, and call it a forgiveness of debt. It's a one item, and they can use it as a, you know, as a, as a book tax difference, if you would, and, and M1 it or what have you and on your tax return. Makes it cleaner. You're not going. I don't think you're going to change your your charges to your jobs because of the forgiveness. You should keep score the same way you always did, and when you go to do your tax return. If they still maintain they want this done, then I would just reduce the expense on my tax return for wages and, and benefits and wherever the uh, other items that fell into uh, utilities and interest and rent uh, to be easier than to do that. So I think that uh, as we go through this process, this is a bit clearer as to how we should be treating this. But by and large, uh, you should be able to qualify. Uh, I would think twice about maybe extending it if you're if you're running up, you couldn't start up and couldn't get fully up. And some jobs got canceled or delayed, and you don't have the payroll in that eight-week period. Most people should be hitting that eight-week period right about now. Uh, so look at your timeline and act accordingly. All right, uh, I think that's. It for me at the moment. I uh, would, like the rest of us, would welcome any questions you have. Uh, hopefully, uh, we'll try to get back to your questions as we, uh, if we get them on the air. Fine. If not, uh, we'll try to answer them. Get back to you. Uh, maybe have it on our on the site along with the um, slide materials. Uh, Tony, this so, is Drew. Best um, of luck. My understanding is that the the there are questions here that we should all have access to afterwards. And uh, so if we are not able to get to a specific question, uh, we can answer those and those can be posted for everyone. Um, I do see some questions on here uh, that I can uh, read off. Are, are employee benefits uh, such as health and welfare, pension, 401k, state unemployment tax, et cetera, aside from wages, are they included as part of the forgivable portion of employee compensation? I go, in one word, I could say yes, unless Marion or, or Kim want to jump in. That's all part of it. Your, your benefits is the only portion a year that's not limited to the hundred thousand dollar threshold. Just your salary is, but every all the other benefits that you mentioned, uh, I would say including annuities. If you're paying, if the, if the company is paying that. Uh, fringe benefit for the employee is includable. Okay. And so uh, along the same lines for union contractors, would all union benefits be included or just retirement and health? It's well, it only, is just retirement um, and health. Go ahead, Kim. I'm sorry, Tony. I went back no, no, to the PPP Schedule A on the screen, and um, towards the front of the application, it spells out the non 
cash compensation payroll costs. So that's your health insurance, whether it's union or non-union, retirement plans, 401k, pension, and um, in our research, we are including the annuity that unions have. And then employer, not employee, state and local taxes assessed on employee compensation. Okay. And then, Kim, while you're here, I have, I have a question for you. Uh, someone asked to go over Schedule A, Table 2, the $1,900, about that again. So if a person does not make $100,000 for a calendar year in 2019, but has one paycheck over that uh, $1,923.08, do they need to be separated out? They would go in Table 2, where you do not have to test them for um, the loan reduction. Okay. So it's just one pay period in 2019. So if you know there was a pay period that had a lot of overtime or the pay period that you give bonuses out, I ran a report, I have stage 300, and I ran a report for 2019, a weekly time report, and I said, give me all weeks where employees went over the 1923 a week. That's how I did it. Okay. Let's see. Uh, I have one for Marion. Uh, someone, uh, the, their understanding that the loan has to be applied for and approved by the SBA no later than June 30 of this year. Uh, this appeared to be confirmed in yesterday's joint statement. Uh, did you mean the forgiveness application has to be submitted by December 31st? No, the, no, the forgiveness application has to be submitted. This is indirectly. has to be submitted within 10 months of your covered period to end. So, um, because you're supposed to start your payments or repayments if you have not filled out an application for loan forgiveness within the 10 month period. Okay. And, uh, Tony, someone asked, um, how do you think they should classify the loans that, uh, PPP loans that they're receiving and between now and when they're actually forgiven? That's a good question. Very good question. Uh, well, first of all, when you when you accept the money, you obviously debit cash and credit your loan debt, if you would, on your balance sheet, and it stays there, and you just uh, exhaust your cash for the, the payments, and how you track that is an important document, how, how you move the money uh, for either payroll or for these other expenses. Uh, the, the question is, when do you recognize this? Uh, the I guess the, the problem is there isn't a whole lot of guidance out there on, as I mentioned earlier, on the uh, forgiveness of debt and indebtedness. Uh, this is this whole area. It's not like most banks don't lend money and then say you're forgiven. Right? But this is a unique situation, and so the FASB hasn't even uh, even attempted to address that in the past because it didn't exist. Um, now, what I think is going to happen is, question is, when is it really forgiven? The bank comes along, you know, after you submit your, your application for forgiveness, and they have 60 days to let you know, and they come back and say, yes, okay, I'm forgiving it. Is that when it's forgiven? All right. And now this may be subjected to what you want to have happen uh, as to when you want to recognize the revenue. But I would say not at least until that point that they've forgiven the debt, would you recognize it, the debt forgiveness? on your accounting records. Uh, but then the SBA has 90 days after that to actually review their uh, documentation and their process of auditing your uh, application. And at that point, if they are fine with it, then they will fund the bank and pay them back for you, basically. Uh, is it then? It's, it's a little gray. But you could probably say, not until the bank gets their money, am I really off the hook? And then again, the, the SBA has, I think, about six years to come back to, to anybody, regardless of under the two million or over the two million, to actually audit. Bankers are not auditors. They probably were finance majors. And this is no slap against bankers. I have a lot of good friends. Um, but they admit that they're not accountants per se. 
Uh, they just got thrown into this. And they were the good guys coming in and lending you the money, and they don't want to be the bad guys on the way out. But So if you document your files enough and, and say you did all this stuff that you're supposed to do, that Kim went through and, and filling out the form and backing it up, uh, they're going to say, yeah, everything's good. All right. I hope that maybe answered it a little too much. but <laughs> uh, that not that just the, the nature of answering questions sometimes? Um, yes. <laughs> there is there is a, a hopefully a short question here. Can you say again if another application will be released? Um, and I'm not sure if that's a forgiveness application. I'm kind of assuming uh, that's the case. Uh, Tony, I know you and I had spoken that when these PPP loan applications came out that the banks actually took them and made their own based off of what the SBA provided, correct? That's correct. And and I'm kind and of all the banks that, that I was aware of. Similar process. I mean, so these uh, forgiveness applications will be coming, I would suspect, from the banks for which they applied to this, for this loan. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll say this. Here's my thought on it real quick. Uh, I did ask a couple of bankers, and they said, no, we're probably going to use the form. This form, okay. as, as Kim went through it, is too complicated. Uh, for the bank to say, well, we're going to create our own form like that. So that's gotcha. my thought. Excellent. But it will be adjusted for the Flexibility Act that was signed on Friday. Okay. So we are expecting a revision. Yes. Okay. Um, man, there are a lot of questions on here, which is great. So uh, hopefully we can uh, spend some time and answer these afterwards as well. Um, I have a question on their, on average hourly wage. It appears that overtime could play a factor here. If the employee, employee worked a lot of overtime in quarter one, but none or little overtime in the eight-week period. Could that play a, a factor? Yes, it will, unfortunately. Um, if you look at the example uh, that I have up for the hourly person, you know, it gives you the average hourly uh, wage, and that does include the overtime. Okay, so that affects the FTE calculation? Right. Not the FTE calculation, because uh, you no. include hours over 40, but okay. the wage reduction, it can affect. I'll just say that that affects the aggregate in the eight week period of 15,345 uh, or whatever it is. Uh, so if there's a lot of overtime, it would only be in the aggregate. You just have to stop at that point. Uh, there's another question here. Do you have to formally elect the eight week or 24 week period? And when would you have to do that by? The statute, this is Marion, the statute doesn't provide those details. Um, you have the option of opting into a 24-week period. So if you do nothing, um, you, you're in the eight-week period. I am sure the SBA will issue some kind of clarification on that, being a strictly administrative thing. I think, yeah, I would notify, if you're planning to extend, I would just notify my bank because they would be expecting within 60 days after the, or in a short period after your, your period is up, your eight weeks, uh, to see it. So that's just a practical thing. Marion, can I add to that question? Do you know if um, you opt for the 24 weeks and you run out of money at week 18, can you submit your application at that point? Or do you really have to wait until 1231 for the FTEs? Um, those are unclear. That, that's, that's one of the big questions. Is do you have to wait um, to establish that you, well, that's the safe harbor date, if that's what you So you have, you have issues, then you gotta wait for that date. But 
it'll be calculated based on your 24 week period if you choose that. And I guess the question is, can you choose a shorter period rather than between eight and 24? My reading on that at Correct. the moment is Continue. no. It's one or the other. Okay. Yeah, and I think that's probably what's going to go for simplicity purposes. Yeah. You know, the fact that they're – Mary, maybe you can clarify this, too. The uh, June 30th date, was, which is where you're supposed to – if you're doing the eight weeks, it's supposed to be where you benchmark your FTEs as of, because it says as of 630. I assume it's, it's also as of 1231. Yeah, they just substituted same, at the same time. Yep. So they just took it, just changed it from uh, That's all they did. June to December. Yeah. Uh, here's Which again, I think because of the safe harbor, I think you're going to be okay. Because it's kind of crazy. December 31st, if it's as of December 31st, you may have a lot of people aren't working December 31st, the day before New Year's. <laughs> you, know? you may have an extremely low FTE that, was, that day. So. Yeah, they haven't thought it all the way out, but I think the, the safe harbors will, will cover you, my opinion. Uh, there's a question here. If you return the money because originally you didn't think you qualified, can you request for a loan again uh, if you are able to rehire your employees? That sounds like a gray area where someone might have been uh, concerned ab ab about uh, whether or not they uh, qualify for it or not. Yeah, they got scared by the um, all those frequently asked questions and, and then removals concerning yeah. um, the faith and, and uncertainty and the need for a loan. There's nothing in the statute or in any of the SBA docs that I've reviewed that talks that prohibits a loan um, an applicant reapplying for a loan. We had a client that um, was rejected by one bank and reapplied to another and got it. So I don't think there's a prohibition per se. So, I mean, would uh, would you maybe suggest that they uh, speak to their bank about it? I would. Yes. Of course. Definitely. Um, um, there is a little bank shopping you can do. But still, talk to the bank that you applied and see what their initial reaction is, because that's the relationship, and that's what drives a lot of these things, is the relationship. Absolutely. Uh, and they still have money to give out, so I think the, the banks will be willing to probably be considered about that. Yeah. Uh, if someone was able to achieve their 75%, and, and – uh, the question here is 56 days, but so if they were able to achieve that, is there any reason to wait and hold off, I guess, for that 24-week period uh, if they've already achieved that milestone? I would say no. If they use, I wouldn't hold yeah, off. If they used up all their money, it would be a no. Yeah, and I guess if they were really aggressive in certain and, and and paying certain things, maybe they would want to consider it. Um, and I guess one of the issues, well, anyway. But if you've made it, then why why extend? Yeah. Uh, along the same lines, if uh, if they've if their payroll, if we easily have the allowable wages, should we bother tracking expenses other than payroll? My opinion would be no. You actually don't have to claim those other expenses at all. You can, if you exceed it with your payroll, uh, and and just uh, get you out of those gray areas of what's in transportation, what's interest, uh, you know, other than a mortgage, you know, those kind of gray areas that you won't have to deal with if, if the payroll covers it. It's a payroll protection act for that. Too, so what they intend. Yes. So you should. Be yeah, they want it to be for payroll. Tony, you, you mentioned about the memo uh, earlier for the audit. Uh, would you send that with the forgiveness application, or would you just maintain that in the file in case of an audit? 
Well, it can't hurt to include it because I, I don't know the I don't think the banks yet have gotten like their marching orders of what they should be looking for. Again, they're not accountants, they're not auditors. You know, CPAs and public practice are auditors, and and we're we're accustomed to doing these kind of things. The bank's going to have to follow some kind of a, some guidelines issued by I think the SBA saying. Do they have this? Do they have that? Do they have that? So I would have it ready. But when you talk to your banker, ask them, do they want that included? That's why it's important to talk to them. As an aside there, um, the SBA has said a number of times that the banks are justified in relying on the certifications. Um, that's sort of the language they use. But to what extent will the, will certain banks go beyond that and actually start questioning or investigating or auditing or reviewing the certifications. I don't think of many would, but I don't know. I agree with you, Marion. I, I don't think that they, they're, they're, they're not going to go into any debt. Again, they want to be the good guys. They're relying totally on the certifications, both in and out. And that's no. been, it's been stated, stated that they're off the hook because of that. But they may be required to just have a ticker file of things that they should check for that's included in the in the uh, the, the application for forgiveness. That's all I'm saying. Just check with them if it's if it's there. If not, just keep it on file. Okay. Well, I, I see we we still have quite a few people here, but it's uh, just past five minutes past twelve. So. Um, I don't have any grand closing thoughts here, but I would like to thank Marion and Kim and Tony uh, and Olivia behind the scenes as well for help setting this up and, and hope that you have uh, found some useful information here. Um, I'm certain there will be some more updates coming out and uh, we will also do what we can to follow up here on the questions that have not been answered, that have been asked but not been answered because there, there are plenty of them here. And thank you all again, and I uh, hope you guys have a great day. Yep, stay safe thank out there. Thank you, Drew. Thank you, thank you everybody. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, Tom.